The Mystery of the Spiteful Letters by Enid Blyton Read for you by Brandon Reese taylor on the Jesse Millett YouTube channel. Chapter 1. The Extraordinary Telegram Bets and Pip were waiting impatiently for Larry, Daisy and Fatty to come. Bets was on the window seat of the playroom looking anxiously out of the window. I wish they'd book up, she said. After all, they came home from boarding school yesterday and they've had plenty of time to come along. I do want to know if Fatty's got any more disguises and things. I suppose you'll think there'll be another first class mystery for us to solve these holes, said Pip. Golly, that was a wizard one we had in the Christmas holes, wasn't it? Yes, said Bets. A bit too wizard. I wouldn't really mind not having a mystery these holes. Bets! And I thought you were such a keen detective, said Pip. Don't you want to be a find outer any more? Of course I do. Don't be silly, said Bets. I know you don't think I'm much use, because I'm the youngest and only nine, and you're all in your teens now, but I did help an awful lot last time, when we solved the mystery of the secret room. Pip was just about to say something squashing to his little sister when she gave a yell. Here they are, at last. Here are Larry and Daisy. Let's go and meet them. They tore downstairs and out into the drive. Bets flung herself on the boy and girl in delight, and Pip stood by and grinned. Hello, Larry. Hello, Daisy. Seem fatty at all? No, said Larry. Isn't he here? Blow. Let's go to the gate and watch for him. Won't it be fun to see old Buster again, too, wagging his tail and trotting along on his short, scotty legs? The four children went to the front gate and looked out. There was no sign of Fatty or Buster. The grocery van drove by. Then came a woman on a bicycle. Then up the lane plodded a most familiar figure. It was Mr Goon the policeman, or old Clearoff, as the children called him. He was going round on his beat and was not all pleased to see the four children at Pip's gate watching him. Mr Goon did not like the children and they certainly did not like him. There had been three mysteries to solve in their village of Peterswood in the last year, and each time the children had solved them before Mr Goon. Good morning, said Larry politely, as Mr Goon came by, panting a little, for he was so plump. His frog eyes glared at them. So you're back, like bad pennies, he said. Ho, oh, poking your nose into things again, I suppose. I expect so, said Pip cheerfully. Mr. Goon was just about to make another crushing remark when there came a wild ringing of bicycle bells and a boy came round the corner at top speed on a bicycle. Telegraph boy, said Pip. Look out, Mr. Goon, look out. The telegraph boy had swerved right over to the policeman and it looked as if he was going straight into him. Mr. Goon gave a yelp and skipped like a lamb out of the way. Now then, what are you riding like that for? A public danger, you boys are, exploded Mr. Goon. Sorry, sir, my bicycle sort of swerved over, said the boy. Did I hurt you, sir? I'm really sorry. Mr. Goon's temper cooled down at the boy's politeness. What house are you wanting, he asked. I've got a telegram for Master Philip Hilton, said the telegraph boy, looking at the name and address on the orange envelope in his hand. Oh, here's Pip, said Bets. Ooh, Pip. A telegram for you. The boy propped his bicycle by the side of the pavement, its pedal catching the curb, but he didn't balance it very firmly and it fell over with a clatter, the handlebar catching Mr Goon on the shin. He let out such a yell that all the children jumped. He hopped round, trying to hold his ankle and keep his balance too. Betts gave a sudden giggle. Oh sir, I'm sorry, cried the boy. That dratted bike... It's always falling over. Don't you be angry with me, sir. Mr Goon's red face was redder than ever. He glared at the telegraph boy and rubbed his ankle again. You deliver your telegram and clear off, he said. Wasting the time of the post office, that's what you're doing. Yes, sir, said the boy meekly, and gave Pip the orange envelope. Pip tore it open, full of curiosity. He had never had a telegram sent to him before. He read it aloud. It was from Fatty. Sorry not to see you these holes. Have got a mystery to solve in Tippy Lulu, and I'm leaving by aeroplane today. 
All the best, Fatty. The children crowded round to see the telegram. They couldn't believe their ears. What an extraordinary telegram. Mr. Goon could hardly believe his ears either. You let me see that, he said, and took it out of Pip's hand. He read it out loud to himself. This is from that Frederick Trotterville, isn't it? He said. Fatty, you call him, don't you? What does it mean? Leaving by aeroplane for Tippy, Tippy, whatever it is. Never heard of the place in my life. It's in South China, said the telegraph boy, unexpectedly. I got an uncle there, that's how I know. But, but, why should Fatty go? Why should he solve a mystery out there? Why, why, began the four children, absolutely taken aback. We shan't see him, these halls, suddenly wailed Betts, who was extremely fond of Fatty, and had looked forward very much to seeing him. And a good thing too, said Mr Goon, giving the telegram back to Pip. That's what I say, a jolly good thing too. He's a tiresome nuisance, that boy is, pretending to play at being a detective and using disguises to deceive the law and poking his nose in where it's not wanted. Perhaps we'll have a little peace these holidays if that interfering boy has gone to tippy, tippy, whatever it is. Tippy Lulu, said the telegraph boy, who seemed as much interested as anyone else. I say, sir, is that telegram from the clever chap, Mr Trotville? I've heard about him. Mr Trotterville, echoed Mr Goon, indignantly. Why, he's no more than a kid. Mr Trotterville? Mr Interfering Fatty, that's what I call him. Betts gave a sudden giggle again. Mr Goon had gone purple. He always did when he was annoyed. Sorry, sir, didn't mean to make you all hot and bothered, sir, said the telegraph boy, who seemed very good indeed at apologising for everything. But, of course... We've all heard of that boy, sir. Very, very clever chap, he seems to be. Didn't he get on some big plot last hole, sir, before the police did? Mr Goom was not at all pleased to hear that Fatty's fame was apparently spread abroad like this. He did one of his snorts. You got better things to do at the post office than listen to fairy tales like that, he said to the eager telegraph boy. That boy Fatty's just an interfering little nuisance, and always was and he leads these kids here into trouble too. I reckon their parents will be pretty glad that boy's gone to Tippy Tippy er uh... Tippy Lulu, said the boy, obligingly. Fancy him being asked out there to solve a mystery, sir. Coo, he must be clever. The four children were delighted to hear all this. They knew how the policeman must hate it. You get along now, said Mr Goon, feeling that the telegraph boy was a real nuisance. Clear off! You've wasted enough time. Yes, sir, certainly, sir, said the polite boy. Fancy that fellow going off to Tippy Lulu. Coo, I must write to my uncle out there and get him to tell me what Mr. Trotterville do... what Mr. Trotterville's doing. Coo. Clear off, said Mr. Goon. The boy winked to the others and took hold of his bicycle handles. The children couldn't help liking him. He had red hair, freckles all over his face red eyebrows, and a funny twisty mouth. He got on his bicycle, did a dangerous swerve towards Mr Goon, and was off down the road, ringing the two bells he had as, he had as loudly as ever he could. There's a boy that's civil and respectful to the law, said Mr Goon to the others, and he's an example to follow, see? But the other children were no longer paying attention to the policeman. Instead, they were looking at the telegram again. How surprising it was! Fatty was surprising, of course, but to go off by plane to China. Mother would never let me do a thing like that, said Pip. After all, Fatty's only thirteen. I can't believe it. Betts burst into tears. I did so want him to come back for the holes and find another mystery, she, she wailed. I did, I did. Shut up, Betts, and don't be a baby, said Pip. We can solve mysteries without Fatty, can't we? But privately, each of them knew that without Fatty, they couldn't do much. Fatty was the real leader, the one who dared to do all kinds of things, the real brain of the find-outers. Without Fatty, we're like rabbit pie without any rabbit in it, said Daisy, dolefully. That sounded funny, but nobody laughed. They all knew what Daisy meant. Things weren't nearly so exciting and interesting without Fatty. 
I just can't get over it, said Larry, walking up the driveway with the others. Fatty off to China. And what can be the mystery he's solving there? I do think he might have found time to come and tell us. That telegraph boy thought an awful lot of Fatty, didn't he, said Betts. Fancy, Fatty must be getting quite famous. Yes, old Clearoff didn't like him praising up Fatty, did he? chuckled Larry. I liked that boy. He sort of reminded me of someone, but I can't think who. I say, what's going to happen to Buster? suddenly said Betts, stopping still in the driveway. Fatty wouldn't be allowed to take his dog with him, and Buster would break his heart left alone. What do you think is happening to him? Couldn't we have him? I bet Fatty would like us to have him, said Pip. Let's go up to Fatty's house and ask his mother about Buster. Come on, we'll go now. They all turned and went back down the drive. Betts felt a little comforted. It would be something to have Fatty's dog, even if they couldn't have Fatty. Dear old Buster, he was such a darling and had shared all their mysteries. They came to Fatty's house and went into the drive. Fatty's mother was picking some daffodils for her vases and she smiled at the children. Back for the holidays, she asked. Well, I hope you'll all have a nice time. You're looking very solemn. Is anything the matter? Well, we just came to see if we could have Buster for the halls, said Larry. Oh, there he is. Buster, Buster, old fellow, come here. 